Hi, you're with Chandeep at Goodly once again, and in this video, I'm going to talk about some very interesting DAX tricks. Now, this also happens to be my first video that I'm creating in Dubai. Let's just get started. All right, the first trick has to do with the max function in Power BI. Now, in Power BI, when you start writing the max function, you are not allowed to enter more than two values in that function. So, what if I wanted to check the max between three items. So take a look at this little example that I have here. I have three measures, which is product one sales, product two sales and product three sales. And I want to find the max of that. Now I would not be able to use the max function. If I try to write the max function, I right click on the sales table, make a new measure and I write max sales and I write the max function. In the max function, you can see that it's only asking me for two values here, scalar one and scalar two, single value one, and single value two. I can just write product one and I can write product two. Now, as soon as I put another comma to write the third value, it starts to give me that red underline here. That means I would not be able to write the third value here because it just accepts two values. Now, how do I expand this function or come up with a whole new different way so that I can find max between more than two values? Now, the solution lies in not the max function, but the max x function. Here is a little trick. So you start writing with the max x function. The first part of any x function is the name of the table, just like you would expect. So here I am trying to write a table. Now I'm just going to create an artificial table here by starting the curly brackets and I make a table. In the table, I will write three values, the values that I have to find the max for. So I'm just going to write product one, next row, product two, and then finally product three. Now these three values will actually form a table. So first row of the table, second row of the table, and the third row of the table. Now from this table that has been formed, I just want to find the max value. Now the header of this table is going to be a value and I'm just going to maybe write the header value here and just going to close the bracket and that completes my function. This is the table that I have created, which is where I have three values. And then the name of the column header is going to be the standard value column and I close the bracket, press enter. Now if I drag that particular measure into my visual right here and perhaps create maybe a card right here, you can see that I do get 5000, which is nothing but the max of the three, right? Now, this is not the trick that I have known of myself. I learned this trick from Owen and you can take a look at the blog that I have written. I have uh, described the method in more detail there, but that's the trick where you can find max of more than two values by using max x function, not the max function. Let's just move on. All right, the second trick has to do with calculating for non-blanks. Take a look at the small table that I have here. So the first column is the sales state and the second column is the value. Now, maybe I have a need where I'm trying to find the sum of the value or the total of the value for only those rows where the date is not a blank. That means the date is actually mentioned. Now, there could be a lot of ways in which you can do the calculation, but I'm just going to tell you a nice little trick in which you can actually do that. So I'm just going to hop over to my visual right here and you can see that I have dragged the value column into the visual right here and the total is 28,490. If I exclude the blanks, it's going to be certainly a lesser value than 28,000. So how do I actually do that calculation? I'm just going to make a new measure right here and just start to write a simple calculation. So I'm just going to say calculate for non-blanks and I'm going to use the calculate function. In the calculate function, I will write my measure or my calculation. So I'm just going to write sum of the value column. That's what I want to do. And if I just mention the name of the column where I want the blanks to be excluded, it will actually do that. That column was the sales date column. And if I just mention the name of the column, I'm just mentioning that right here, that is actually going to exclude out wherever it is actually blank. I press enter and I am just going to drag that calculation to my visual right here and make a card right here. And if you just uh, take a look at this, this is actually lesser than 28,000 to be precise. This number is actually about 19,840. So that's the correct answer. Now mentioning the name of the column, which has blanks is actually going to exclude the blanks of the calculation. If you happen to write that as the second input of the calculate function. Now I do have a couple of more interesting tricks relating to this particular trick and for which you will have to just jump over to the blog post that I'm going to mention underneath the video and take a look at all the tricks that relate to this particular trick. Let's just move on. All right, my third trick has to do with reverse filters. If you don't already know this, this is absolutely going to blow your mind. Now, time and again, you must have watched videos and learned this concept that if you're trying to build a relationship, which is a one to many relationship between the dimension table and the fact table, the filters actually flow from the dimensions table to the fact table and not the reverse way out. Let me explain. So here I have two very simple tables here. We have the sales table, we have the products table. The products table will be able to filter any of the calculations in the sales table 
but the reverse will not happen. That means if I take one of the columns from here, it would not be able to filter any of the calculations that I'm trying to do in the products table. That's the nature of how relationships work, like a standard one-to-many relationship in Power BI, which is one directional. Now, what if I actually wanted want that to happen? I wanted the reverse filter to happen. I wanted one of the columns in the sales table to be able to filter the calculation in the products table. How do you make that happen? Let me present to you a case here. So here in the sales table, I have a very simple column here called order priority. Let me just open the sales table right here. And I have a very simple column here called order priority. This simply means that what is the priority of the order? Is it low? Is it high? Things like that. Now I have dragged that column. This is the column of the sales table in my pivot table right here, uh, which is the order priority. Now against the order priority, I'm trying to find out how many unique models have I sold of different products that I have. Let me show you that column as well. So if I just go over to the products table, I have a column called model name, and I'm just trying to find out against every single priority of the order, how many unique models have I sold. So you can see that mountain 100, mountain 100 has been repeated, and I don't really want to show that multiple number of times. I'm just trying to find the unique count of that. I'm sure you're aware of the formula. That's a distinct count formula. And that's the formula that I ended up writing in this particular measure. Let me just open that measure and you will find that that's the formula that I have. Now, obviously this number doesn't seem to be right. It's 119 all across all the rows because, sorry, the sales table order priority column will not be able to filter any calculation which is based on the products table. And this is the calculation which is based on the products table. And if it's not able to filter it, you get to see the entire number. That means we have 119 unique models, but it's not able to tell you that against urgent, how many unique models do we have against low, how many unique models do we have? so on and so forth. How do I make that happen when I can actually take a column of the sales table and filter a calculation in the products table? So here is a little trick. What you do is you write the calculate function. In the calculate function, it asks you for an expression and that's my expression that I want to evaluate. Now in the second part of the calculate, which is where it asks you for a filter, you just write the name of the table against which you want to apply the filter. That's going to be my fact table or the sales table. Now doing that is going to run the distinct count for every item in the sales table, which it matches. I close the bracket it, I press enter. Now you would find that the calculation actually changes and gives you the right output. Now it still appears to be incorrect because you have 40 all across, but this is actually the right number because we have large data. All the models were covered in all the different priority orders that we have, but th that is the, actually the way to do it. So simple trick. If you actually wanted to apply the reverse filters by standard definition, it doesn't happen. But if you wanted that to happen, what you can do is wrap your calculation inside of the calculate function and as a second part of the calculate function write the entire fact table and that is how you can take one of the columns of the fact table and be able to filter one of the calculations in the dimension table all right let's just move on to the next trick all right the next trick is large numbers how do you write large numbers in power bi now this trick is ridiculously easy but i tend to use it a lot it's very very helpful so maybe for some reason, I'm just trying to write a very large number, right? Maybe let's just say 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, whatever the number is, but I'm just trying to write a large number. And maybe I have a hassle of counting the number of zeros that I end up writing after the main number. And that's the problem that I actually have to solve. So just take a look at this little measure that I have created, nothing too significant, but I'm just trying to write a million here. So I actually have to count in my head the number of times I hit the zero on my keyboard to be able to write six zeros exactly. Now that is fine, but at the time of reading it, you also have to be very attentive as to how many zeros you end up reading. One of the easy ways, and I tend to do it a lot, is that you can actually write one and multiply that with 10 raised to the power of six. So there is a raised to the power sign on the keyboard, which is I think on the number six key, and you can actually use that with the shift key. Now this actually tells me that I'm just trying to write a million because six zeros actually mean a million, and it's actually going to give you the same output. If you try to use the nomenclature in India, uh, and you want to write a lakh, you can write a five. Or if you want to write a crore, you can actually write a seven. This is one of the very easy ways that I tend to write the number of zeros that I want to have in my numbers, so that it becomes very easy to write it as well as to read it. Let's just move on. All right, the next trick has to do with the if function. Now, when you're writing the if function in Excel, you leave the false part as empty. It actually gives you a false as an output. But in Power BI, you can actually leave the false part as blank and write nothing over there. And it's actually give you a blank value. That can be helpful in a lot of scenarios. Take a look at this very simple measure that I'm trying to write here. So I'm saying that if the total sales is greater than uh, or equal to a million, then do something. If not, then 
it's actually a blank. So what I can do is I have actually written my condition here. I have written the true part here and I have not written the false part. I've actually left it out as blank. But if I actually go over and make that as false, that means this condition is actually giving me a false and we don't have a false part. This is actually going to return you a blank value here and you can actually use that at a, at a lot of places in Power BI where you actually want to use a blank if the if condition doesn't actually match the condition. So that was another one. All right, the next trick has to do with creating a table named measures. Maybe you're trying to create a lot of DAX calculations and you want to store all your measures in a table named measures. Guess what? You would not be able to do that because the name measures is a reserved name and you're not allowed to use that name for some, I don't know for what reason. But anyways, let's just go over to the modeling tab and let's just try to do that. So I just make a new table and call that table as a measures table. Let's just see what happens. M-E-A-S-U-R-E-S. And I'm just going to maybe make a blank table, have nothing inside of that, commit to that, press enter, and it gives me an error. Now, if I really wanted to have that, how do I make it happen? Now, I learned this trick from Phil Seamark on his blog. I'm just going to leave a link. You can take a look at that. But here is a trick. So you write the word measures inside of the square bracket and you have a leading space before you write the word measures and you just kind of commit to that. If you do that, that is actually going to create a table named measures and the space is just going to be taken off and you would not have the space and you would still be able to make a table named as measures. All right, the next trick has to do with uh, working out measures in DAX Studio. Now, if you've been working with DAX Studio for a while, you obviously understand that DAX Studio is a tool where you can execute queries. In simple form, you will be able to write a DAX statement and if that DAX statement gives you a table as an output, DAX Studio is fantastic for it. You would not be able to execute and take a look at a measure. Here is what I mean to say. So I start with writing a simple statement called evaluate. That's how you start. And then maybe I want to evaluate total sales and total sales does not give me a table. It actually gives me a full and final one singular value, which is the total sales value. So I'm just going to write a measure here, which is my total sales. And if I just hit a run here, it's actually going to give me an error because DAX Studio is not made to evaluate uh, measures. It's just made to evaluate tables. Now, how do I make sure that I'm able to also evaluate measures? So what you can do is you can actually create an artificial table by, you know, writing a curly bracket and close that calculation inside of the curly bracket. And now if you hit the run and try to evaluate that, you're actually going to be able to see total sales. Now, just the way that we have done it for one measure, you can also actually do it for two calculations. You can actually provide a comma here and maybe write another calculation. So I have maybe, maybe product one sales hit on run. And we now have two values. Now this is formed in form of a table. You can see that we have a table named value here, a column named value, and we have two different in outputs here, but that's totally fine. And that's the way you kind of evaluate measures by creating an artificial table inside of the DAX Studio to be able to evaluate your measures. Let's just move on. All right, trick number nine has to do with some interesting DAX shortcuts. Now, these are my three favorite shortcuts that I end up using a lot, and we'll close the video with this particular shortcut thing. Now, let's just say that you are trying to copy the previous line of DAX. Most people would end up using Control C, Control V for that. Nothing too bad, but I have a better one. So let's just say that I have written this same period last year in this long DAX statement that I'm trying to write. And what if I wanted to copy this particular line, same period last year, one more time? So instead of just selecting the entire line and then pressing Control C and V, I can just go anywhere inside of this uh, DAX statement, line number five, and then I can hit the shortcut Alt Shift down arrow to be able to copy that entire line. Now, that doesn't just happen with a line, it can also happen with multiple lines altogether. Let's just say that I want to copy all the lines from three to six. Once again, I can select these lines. Even if you've made a half selection, that is okay. Now, you, once you make that selection, you just use the same shortcut Alt Shift down arrow, and you would be able to copy that entire segment of DAX throughout. Now let's just say that you have copied these lines and maybe you want to move these lines to another place in DAX. Now what you can do is let these lines be selected and you can use the Alt and the down arrow to be able to move these lines down or up than their current position. So maybe I just hit the Alt arrow and then use the down key to be able to move these lines down and I can actually use the Alt and the up key to you know move these lines up. All right, another very interesting keyboard shortcut that I use a lot is the ability to replace multiple words at once. He does what I mean to say. So let's just say this is a DAX statement that I'm trying to write and I've used a variable called LY sales at multiple places. This is where I declare the variable, then I use it here, then I use it here and at multiple places. What if I want to change the name of the variable 
but I want the change to happen instantaneously for all the places that I have used the variable. So let's just say that I just go here and I select my variable. Now the shortcut that I'm going to use is Control Shift L is for the ability to go select all the LY sales that have been mentioned inside of my DAX calculation. That's the first part. Now once you select that, don't lose the selection and you start typing the new name of the variable. Let's just say that I start typing last year sales, that's what I want to call it. Once I do that, you can see that your cursor is still blinking at three different places. If you continue to work with this, you will actually go work at three different places. Now you have to hit control and the home button for your cursor to come at the start of the DAX code and now you're free to move anywhere inside of your DAX code. And that's the way that I actually use to be able to replace a lot of uh, statements and a lot of words simultaneously inside of my DAX formulas. Alright, those were the nine tricks that I wanted to speak about today. Let me know how many tricks did you already know and how many tricks did you learn from this particular video. If you would want to learn DAX right from scratch, build on the fundamentals first and then move on to solving more complicated, more sophisticated problems with your own data, perhaps you should actually check out my course on DAX and that is going to be extremely beneficial. That's all for now. Thanks so much for watching this and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Cheers. Bye.